Uh, we're live. They said we're already live. Yeah. Hey, Joe. Uh, Hello, Matt. Matt. <laughs> so um, I'm Matt Sayer with Onward Eugene, and uh, we're here today talking build, building business resiliency. Um, I'm excited to be joined by uh, Joe Marushak, Managing Director of Coast to Crest. Um, yeah. So no, I'm not really in Colorado. Joe, where are you? I'm on my home in Eugene. You know, so I'm just sitting here in my downstairs library, um, sequestered in my house, as most of us have been for the past couple of weeks. So, right on. So, um, uh, before we really dive into today's topic, um, I think people would benefit from some really time sensitive information and resources that are out there in the community that um, are emerging by like minute by minute. I'm, I'm yeah. talking about new things that are out there. It's um, a really dynamic business marketplace right now. And so I thought we might just give uh, a rundown on some of these programs that, that are out there uh, for people who have short attention spans and just put that really good stuff right at the beginning of this webinar. Yep. So I, I'll just, you know, do a shout out for Shine. So Shine is a, what formerly was a layoff version program where we have a team of people that we're working with, uh, people do layoff version, um, working with them to restructure their business, point them in the right direction um, to get them where, you know, so where they needed to be to face new markets. And given what's been over, over, uh, going on over the last month, that probably includes everybody. So um, it's a totally free program. And if you're interested in learning about it, you can go to um, what, lanecountyshine.org. I think and you have the, you'll have the link, Matt, or you can contact Shane Johnson um, and Shane Johnson, you can actually reach out to Matt and he can forward you along to Shane. Um, that's a really good program. We'll sit down with you and just sort of discuss like where you're at, where you need to be and help you plan for it. So that's the first one. The second one is, you know, everything going on with the SBA, which what, again, this first, is- First say, yeah, what is the SBA? What does that acronym stand for? The Small Business Administration. So they manage mostly loans, um, but they manage a, a whole bunch of stuff. Essentially, it's the agency of the federal government that manages most things that have to do with small businesses. And they've been coming out, I mean, it seems like every other day now, we're on our third stimulus package. Every sing thing, single stimulus package that's come out has had something for the SBA for small businesses. Um, and you know, they just did another one like, what, an hour ago that's going to have more stuff for the SBA. So really go to, you know, go to SBA. Um, I think it's SBA.gov and check what's going on there. And this is kind of happening in real time. But there's a ton of programs, including loan programs. There's um, going to be a unemployment abatement program where if you keep people employed, you can partially lay people off. They collect unemployment. You know, so you don't have to fully lay them off. So there's all these new programs coming up that you should just check out. Um, most of these programs locally are being administered by the SBDC, the local SBDC. So reach out to the local SBDC here in Eugene. They're going to be up to speed on everything that needs to happen here um, to get your loan, um, and they will be able to walk you through all the programs. So One, one thing that um, always has stood out to me is, uh, you know, it's called the Small Business Administration. But if, if I understand correctly, their definition of small business is any company that is uh, under $100 million in revenue. Yeah, like under 500. You know, so yeah. small business is, doesn't have to be small, small. It's someone who's not necessarily a large corporation. So, um, you know, take a look because there's a ton of programs coming out and some of them may apply to you. So, and then, you know, I, I think in normal times, sort of um, um, some people see like, they don't want to signal that they're struggling. Right. You know, and right now it's like, don't be afraid to signal that you're struggling. I haven't had one conversation over the last two weeks where some business that I've talked to isn't struggling or at least struggling to make sense of what's going to come, going to happen in the next couple months. So definitely reach out, see what's available. Um, and if, and, and some of this is, um, this is not just about say an individual business owner. It's also about your employees. You know, so these programs were put in place and the system was put in place to sort of prop up the system. And if we're not taking advantage of the, you know, this, it's kind of part of the stimulus package. If we're not taking advantage of these programs to keep the economy propped up to the extent we can during these times, then we're not doing our job. So it's like, if you've got nothing to do and you're sitting at home, this is something that you can do if you own a small right. business. So let, let's keep running on this uh, short list. We both have another acronym, SBIR. Small Business Innovation Research Grants. So there's a whole bunch of people in, in, that are associated with research at the university that know what SBIRs are. Um, right now, I think it was yesterday or the day before, they just announced a whole new stream of 
uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic response SBIRs that just opened up. So if you search SBIR pandemic response on Google, you'll probably get to the new SBIR page um, and you can sort of read up on that. There are a ton of people in town that have done SBIRs before uh, through the university. And you know you can again, reach out to Matt at Onward Eugene. We'll try and connect you with the right resources. There are some agencies in the state that actually work with SBIRs. They actually do this, called, it's called a phase zero program. Um, which helps you get set up to actually do your grant submission. Um, and those resources are going to be slammed in the short term, but, you know, we'll get you connected to the right people if you reach out to us. Love it. Um, next acronym, WARN. Oh, WARN. Uh, this is the WARN Act. So this is something that everyone should be aware of because this is something that might apply to people. Um, essentially, if your business is over a certain number, forget the number, um, you, you can't get laid off without getting 90 days notice. Right. You know, so so they, they have to notify you within 90 days. A lot of people are doing layoffs immediately, but fall under the WARN Act. The cool thing about the WARN Act, they lay you off. They have to sort of pay you for the next 90 days because they have to give you three months warning. If you are laid off under the WARN Act and they let you go, you can usually collect unemployment right away. So you'll get your salary while you know you're being laid off. The company's sort of saying like, we don't have work for you because of the WARN Act. Good luck. Here's three months' pay, and you right. immediately, you know, file for unemployment and start getting unemployment, which has just been boosted again by way of this new stimulus package. Right. So, so let's uh, one last acronym, and I think probably this is um, uh, uh, not getting talked about a whole lot just yet publicly, um, uh, but it's been around for a while, and it seems like a really good. Uh, SEA. Yeah. On the SEA program, the self-employment assistance. This is through unemployment. So essentially, if you feel like starting a business or feel like doing something, you can uh, get on what's called the SEA program. So what you have to do with SEA is you uh, are on unemployment. You say to the SEA program, hey, I want to start a business and they'll work with you. They work through the SBDCs. You write a business plan, you submit. And what you can do is you can actually start a business and you can collect money from that business while you're getting your unemployment. So it's a supplemental thing. So you can actually make income while you're unemployed starting your business right now. And this is a program that's been around in Oregon. Not all states have this. It's an awesome thing about Oregon. And I used it back, way back in the day in 2001. I mean, it's, a, it's an awesome program. If you're thinking of starting something new, um, definitely one to be looking into. Love it. Um, let's, uh, looks like we're getting some real time feedback here from the, from the audience and, and my, my peers in the community. Um, let's keep talking about unemployment. Um, so there, there's a lot of uh, richness to that program, but let, let's talk about the, like the social stigma around that, because I think we can do everyone a solid by helping people get past that. Um, oh, totally. you know, right now, there are entire groups, right, that are getting laid off. Getting and laid, no fault tons of, their own. of people, tons of people. So yeah, you have, you, you know, usually it's like you get laid off and you're feeling like, oh man, I'm not worth anything, I'm unemployed. Uh, and you kind of hide the fact that you're unemployed. And, you know, right now, unemployment, and I've been talking to a lot of people. So if someone thinks they're unemployed and they're kind of going, oh my God, I'm all alone in this. It's like, no, you're not all alone in this. Within a couple, like within a month, it's going to be one in four people are going to be unemployed or have their employment impacted in some way. Reduction of salary, reduction in hours or um, increase in scope of their responsibility. So, um, I mean, it's, it's hitting all sectors. I mean, hospitality, obviously, you know, restaurants, hospitality, hotels, but we're also seeing other things that are affected in the service sector. We're seeing uh, medical professionals, not the ones that are in the hospitals, but the ones that are working at doctor's offices and vets um, that are seeing reductions in their hours because of lack of demand because everyone's staying home and not doing their normal doctor's appointments. So I think there is this um, def definite stigma of being unemployed, but right now it's, you know, you're in good company. <laughs> you're going to be one of pretty much everyone around you that someone you know is going to be unemployed and given the job market right now unemployed for probably quite some time so i think that there's uh, no shame in being unemployed right now and you know part of this is the unemployment programs and other associated programs like the oregon health plan and snap which is the supplemental nutritional assistance program food stamps yeah. were actually created for systems like this when i think of unemployment you know that's the the, the other tax that's on your pay stub, you've been paying into this program to support the program for a long time. And if you're in need, take advantage of the program. And they actually have a lot of good tools. Uh, they, you know, and they're gonna be kind of overwhelmed, but they have networking programs, they'll help you network. 
they'll help you with your resume. There's a self-employment assistance program. I mean, actually, unemployment's a really good thing in addition to just getting the money to help you get back on your feet. Right on. Uh, and uh, couple of and you, to everyone else, you are not alone. I mean, this yeah. is affecting like a ton of people. So don't be embarrassed if you're unemployed. Yeah, one, one in four, I think are, um, you know, within the next month, probably going to be unemployed. So we're in this together. Uh, a yeah. couple of quick comments. Uh, we had a question from uh, the audience. Hey, what about nonprofits as it relates to SBA? Um, I, I've read a little bit on that. I know that they do still qualify for that um, two million dollar uh, limit fund, and and more specifically, the the interest rates are very approachable. I think I read that they're two point seven five for nonprofits specifically. Wow, yeah, I hadn't read that. That's awesome. And then we had one more comment about uh, the SEA unemployment insurance. Um, just a clarification that you can collect that right while you're working on your next startup or even while you're you're earning some level of money for a small business that you're creating yeah and, and your small business could be like you could open up a consulting business you're doing social media consulting for example and you're making a couple thousand bucks a month or a thousand bucks a month or whatever you can on the side if that's your business you can be collecting your full unemployment not doing a job search actually starting out that consulting business and making money and it doesn't reduce your unemployment and that, that's a pretty powerful program. Yeah, it's so, super powerful. Um, uh, right now is a time of, uh, we're all sort of finding our, our own personal resilience and, and business resilience. And uh, there are a lot of people and, and businesses that are, that are in survival mode. Um, while maybe we haven't seen pandemics, at least not in my lifetime, uh, we have seen recessions, right? And, and you were doing some pretty impressive things, both during the 2001 recession and, and the one that happened in 2008. So I, th I think that there's a lot of um, uh, wisdom from, from those periods of time that, we, that are, can be brought to bear right now. Is this the, the, the side story that we talked about yesterday? Yeah, let's, let's so, your side yeah, story. So, so I started my company, Bravetree, in 2001, um, right after uh, Dynamics closed. So Dynamics was a very large game company, Eugene, in 2001, it got closed down. Its parent company, Vivendi, was having problems related to some financial irregularities, $15 billion in irregularities. We were collateral That's more than damage. a rounding error. Yeah, it, yeah, we were collateral damage. You know, Essentially, it's a big multinational corporation that we're a part of. They owned Sierra, Sierra owned us, and we were just you know, an adjustment on the balance sheet as they were unraveling this ridiculous mess that was a giant multinational corporation. So that was one of those sort of personal re resilience things that survived. I lived through. So when you first get laid off and you're like, oh man, what did I do wrong? Yeah. So there's nothing that we did wrong. We were actually doing everything right. The company was doing well. It just, everyone got laid off. Um, good thing for me, you know, we were covered under the Warren Act, um, got my 90 days notice. They told us, you're working for the next 90 days. Here's your notice. Go home. Don't come back. Um, and we applied for unemployment, got on SEA, and that's how we started the company. Um, we also had a fairly good severance package from Vivendi. It was two weeks for every year that you were there. So I think that I was on, you know, when you count the 90 days plus the other ones, it's like close to six months severance you know, and then got on unemployment immediately. It was like, that was the perfect time to start a business. Um, the other thing was um, what we saw was everyone, it was right after, so it was right after the dot bomb. Right. And then 9-11 happened. So it was like, we closed down and like the first week after we closed down, 9-11 happened. I remember going to the building for like a post orientation wind down thing and like on the TV was the Twin Towers collapsing. So it was, you know, it was, some people say the worst time to start a business, but it was actually the best time to start a business because everyone was deer in the headlights. You know, what's going to happen? Like now, right now. Sounds a lot like now. Yeah. Everyone was deer in the headlights. They didn't know what to do. Everything contracted. Um, people were losing their jobs, but everyone sort of froze up. And you know, over time, everyone started to unfreeze, and we didn't. We hit the ground running. I mean, we started making a game. We started trying to put things together. You know, it's we were ready to go. And back in that time. That was like, oh my God, you know, dot bomb just happened. The web is dead. And it was like, some of us were like, uh, no, the, no, the dog food online is dead. The web is not dead. You know, so we sort of said, no, we think there's a future here in games on the internet. And everyone told us we were stupid in 2001. We later on, people recognized we weren't so stupid for being doing games on the internet. But that's the kind of thing, you know, every time there's a downturn, there's an opportunity. 
you just have to sort of look beyond where we are right now because right now it looks like a disaster and um you know we talked about like worst case scenario like absolute worst case scenario everyone's got all the data wrong gets gets totally a hand 20 percent of the population of the earth dies and i'm like okay 20 if it's not looking even close to that bad but i'm focusing on well 80 percent of us are going to live worst case you know absolute worst case scenario morphs into some zombie killing virus it's like you know there's still 80 percent of it's going to be left and when this passes we have to do something okay we actually have to rebuild and go forward and that's um so you know, so that's my story you know just you these things have happened you know so this you know like a economy downturn everyone gets laid off it's really disastrous um so it's really about this notion of um looking beyond the moment that you're in and getting your mental headspace to sort of look out in the future and and think about what a, a, a couple steps ahead might look like, you know, because this, this will pass. It, this it will pass. pass. And then what happens, you know? I think what everyone's dealing with right now is a, a set of disappointed expectations. You know, um, a plan that they had that, that um, is now not going to happen. You know, so everyone, say a couple months ago, had a plan to go on summer vacation, what they're going to do for their job. Spring or break. Get, spring break. They're going to get a raise. Yeah. They're redecorating their house, whatever your plan was, if whether it's a plan for your business or a personal plan, that plan is now not a plan. You know, so I think that that's uh, a sense of loss, a sense of grief that everyone's sort of going through with whatever plan they had has been shattered. And given the uncertainty of the future, making a new one is very, very difficult. You know, so I think that there's, um, when you talk about personal resiliency and business resiliency, it's actually just like, well, yeah, it's time to start letting go whatever that plan was and stop trying to go back to whatever that plan was. And let's now start to you know, make a new plan. So how do you start right. get past what is gone? You know, this has happened to us. You know, so I, I, hear, I see a lot on Twitter people like, when does this go back to normal? It's like, this is not going back to normal. You know, this has happened. We're in a downturn. People have lost their jobs. People can't make rent. You know, can't go to the food store normally if I do half the things I normally buy or there. So you need this a new not, plan. You need a new plan. Everyone needs a new personal plan. Every business needs a new plan. And, you know, that's when you start looking forward positively toward what is this, you know, what are the, what's the potential for the future? How is life going to change either suddenly or in big ways? And how can you take advantage of that to put yourself in the right place at the right time? And, and just trust that like, I mean, for the most part, pretty much all of us are going to survive. Yeah. What we're what we're going to have is going to be different than what we thought it was going to be, but we're still going to be around. Um, so, what what does that plan look like? Um, yeah. So uh, let let's talk about what that plan looks like on the other side, informed by um, you know some of the observations in the past about uh, businesses and industries that have sort of pivoted. And and what might be the new normal um, on the other side of it? What, what oh, this are the is, things that you're seeing in the marketplace that are changing right now? Well, right now, I mean, certainly everything going online. Mm -hmm. You know, people are shopping online. We're communicating online. We're not sitting. We're not sitting doing a, fi a fireside down at rain. We're actually doing this virtually. So um, a lot of people are working from home. You know, so I think there's going to be a lot of huge opportunities in working from home. I think remote working is going to become a bigger thing. Um, bigger picture, I think a lot of companies, when they're starting to see entire office floors in cities infected or lockdown orders, they're going to start saying like, huh, maybe it's not so smart to have all of our business, all of our entire company in one space. Maybe we should start chunking up our company and stepping around the small cities that are a little bit more resilient. Uh, you know, so these are all possible scenarios that are opportunities for everyone to say, okay, huh, so how do we enable a distributed workforce? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we enable getting um, people that are now staying at home more their stuff? I think the, the idea of online shopping or ordering your groceries and having delivered to you is something that we never looked at seriously before. And I think a lot of people are looking at it a lot more seriously now, you right. know, and if, if our behaviors start to change um, in terms of like, you know, we, we, we now are getting into this new habit. We're making this long store list and then we go to the store and we do this bulk buy and we come home and we have enough for a week. Um, as opposed to what we used to do, which is like, oh, we need food. We jump in the car, we run to the store. So yeah. our habits are changing. And I think for the better in some ways, when you start thinking about everyone's 
um, consumption habits, how we're consuming food, how we're connecting with friends, how we're entertaining ourselves. These are all changing. You know, the entertaining ourselves is a, you know, we, we think like, oh, nothing like this has ever happened before. And it's like, no, we used to get DVDs from Netflix. Now we stream everything, you know, and that was an entire industry of the DVD companies that got blindsided and we're talking blockbuster you know it's a term okay. now yeah. you know so um that didn't happen because because of some dis you know, disaster like like a pandemic it just kind of happened because consumer consumer tastes change so part of this is looking ahead and saying how are our tastes how are our activities going to change how we can we position ourselves to be a part of that change in a good way and trying to turn back the clock well some of it will turn back to normal and some of it will not you know, and some of it may be, if this does end up lasting for the next 12, 18 months with a rolling, you know, sort of the rolling blackout kind of thing that they're saying, these changes might become permanent. So how do you position yourself to be in the right place for what it's going to be as opposed to turning it back to what it isn't anymore? Let's use some, let's like talk about some like practical applications, things that we're seeing on the ground right now here in Eugene, uh, local startups, you know, maybe you could talk about some of the companies in the Coast Crest Pro portfolio and and what you're seeing out of um, their resilience and being nimble well some some of them well, we'll talk about the ones first like maddie from costa grass you know maddie um had this idea a year or two ago tell me that, the name of her company again uh core to core core to core so core to core actually can uh, connects exercise instructors with people who want to exercise at home has a calendar ring application um a Skype type interface, uh, people set up an appointment, they actually do the exercise appointment and all the, the management of the money happens on the back end. And because she set this up because we're a bunch of instructors that wanted to connect their clients, people that were like working moms that didn't have time to go to the gym. Um, good idea, growing market. And then when Peloton sort of, you know, was, was sort of the leader in that, people sort of exercising from home and suddenly this hits and I think that a lot of people are switching to Peloton or switching to services like core to core and going like, this is actually better than going to the gym. You know, I can connect with the people that are, that are my trainers. I can do it on my own time. So I think that that's one of the ones where, especially if you have a rolling, the, the rolling blackout with, with these, these uh, lock-ins over the next 12 months, people are going to be like, well, I don't have to stop exercising. Right. I'll just do it a different way. Yeah. That's one. Um, other one we're seeing is uh, you know, Nulia. So Nulia, they do actually cloud training for Office 365 and uh, Microsoft Office 365. So they actually uh, analyze the tra training of a cloud adoption of remote work tools on the cloud. And the number of people that have fully migrated, like gone full on on Microsoft Office 365 with Microsoft Teams exploded over the past month. You know, and that's, you know, so huge, huge opportunity for them to actually work with training, to train people how to go to a more distributed work from home environment, huge opportunity. So those are two, and then, you know, um, um, Defunkify, Richard Geiger's company, they make, they make um, Defunkify, which is a soap that gets all the funk out of your clothes, also gets, like most soap, but it gets coronavirus out of your clothes. I mean, it's actually a really, yeah. really good soap. And um, people are, I think, noticing that they should clean their clothes and wash their sheets more often. They think they'll be more aware of it. So their sales are booming. So there are some companies here that are doing really, really, really well. Um, that um, they, they have good market prospects. So they're going to weather this storm fine. There's going to be a short-term kind of hit because everything's just upside down. But, you know, at the end of it, they're on the right side because they were building toward a future that they believed was going to exist. Luckily for them, that future came a lot faster. Yeah, and th this brought it about. There are some companies that have been slammed. Um, they're not in a bad way. I mean, I, I think that, you know, uh, Bitcork was working with restaurants, you know, so they're, uh, but they're pivoting slightly. You know, they're going to be working with how do we deliver just about anything using couriers? You know, so it's like, how do you take what they're already doing and expand that to bigger markets to actually meet the challenge of now? Right. And I think they'll serve, you know, this is going to be a tough time for them given what their customer base was. But on the other side of this, I think there's going to be much more awareness of what they were doing, which is micro warehousing and courier deliveries, whole sort of asynchronous delivery where people don't have to be face to face. It's kind of like you, you know, they drop it off at a warehouse. Two people don't have to exchange. It's all done through keypads um, and software. I think that's, act that's actually a thing that people are going to be like, yeah, 
why don't we do it that way? It's a much smarter way to do things. And it's much better from a, from a local supply chain standpoint, because what we're seeing is the big supply chains are breaking down. So more distributed supply chains are actually going to become a thing. They're well positioned to be in the right place at the right time after this passes. You know, so I, I think that those are the ones that are in my head. They're on, on the right side of history. They were building toward a future that they already saw was coming. Um, and it's now it's just coming a little bit faster than they thought. So there'll be, have to be some adjustments and new plans. Um, but they're doing a good job of trying to adjust quickly. So in general, as, as businesses sort of move from, um, you know, survival to sort of recovery mode, um, uh, we know uh, from disaster planners that the first week after a disaster period is incredibly critical uh, for a company to get back up and running. What would you say are some of the first steps a business who had to close the doors would um, sort of should be doing for planning now for, for when that happens? You know, talent. Uh, I mean, the one thing is always line, you know, yeah, well, it's a new, again, the new start line. Um, this is this is the one. It's a new starting line. So if you're starting up a new business, or even if you're a business that's sort of retrenching, if you're doing a startup, what you have to recognize is that um, if you were if you were feeling behind in a new market, well, suddenly this has shaken everybody up. So it's moved everybody back to a new start line. So if you're starting now, or you're in a business that's running right now, when this gets back up and running, the start line's been moved back, and everyone's on even footing going into this new environment. Right. So that's sort of that you know that's for for the people that are small looking to get into it. It's kind of hopeful. It's like now the beast that was the big beast that you couldn't unseat, and they just seemed too big to knock over. Is like no, now they're at the start line, and for the most part, they're just trying to recover. I think talent is going to be the one. There's a lot of people getting laid off, and I think spinning up talent is going to be one of those really crucial things to get up and running quickly. Um, I think right now, if you're planning, keep in touch with prospective employees. Think that there is going to be an end to this and there's going to be a new start and actually being well-staffed and well-prepared is one of the best things that you can do. Um, definitely being aware of all the, you know, the, the finances over the next year, you have to be prepared with what that might look like. So this is keeping track of all the financial stimulus packages and everything that's going on and understanding that you're not alone in that. So I think a, a lot of this is when you think of what you're dealing with, a lot of times that you feel like you're alone in dealing with this, just yeah. realize that everybody is dealing with the same thing. Everyone is dealing with a capital constraint. You know, I was even looking at the, um, reading an article this morning about the mortgage industry. The mortgage industry is terrified of this whole forbearance thing because they have investors too. They're like, we won't be able to make our interest payments on the money that we borrow. You know, right. so so the, the, say, say what forbearance is. A forbearance is, so right now they're pushing out this thing that you can get a forbearance on your mortgage. Basically call up your mortgage lender and say, hey, I can't pay this month. And then your payments sort of accumulate. You won't get any penalties. It won't affect your credit rating. Um, it just allows you to sort of defer your payments for a month. And that might actually end up being expanded, you know, where forbearance is like a, for a year. And if we start seeing that, you know, with all of these mortgages, the mortgage industry is going to be rocked. You know, so it's like that's an opportunity if you want to get into some sort of new mortgage finance that they're going to be struggling to readjust to this because they're going to be hurting for cash mm -hmm. and they're going to have to respond to the, respond to these pressures. So the, the idea that even the big guys are not having to respond to financial pressure is like they, they everyone is and they're going to be caught flat footed and they're going to have to restructure and change how they do things. So when this gets you know, back up and going, um, realize that you're in a might be in a better position than they are. I think everyone that's looking toward a new future is going to be much better off than the, how do we get back to normal. A lot of businesses will fail because after this goes back to some semblance of a normal economy, they're going to start running their business exactly like it was before they started. And it's probably not going to work. And the ones that are adjusting are going to do much, much better. Um, so I'm going to uh, open up uh, do we have any, so we've got uh, quite a few people uh, as attendees. Do we have any questions from the audience members, from the attendees that they want to put to Joe? Um, let's put that out there. Um, and while we wait for those questions, uh, let, let's uh, talk about, you know, one thing that occurred to me is, um, uh, you know, Eugene is a tertiary city and 
a lot of uh, the, the concentration of wealth, of startups, of capital is in, you know, one of three markets, uh, which which isn't, you know, in Oregon at all. So, so um, this is- One of three markets that are under lockdown? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, so, I mean it, this, this is, I think this is a, when you, when you talk about the, the positives for a place like Eugene, is that um, if you're in San Francisco, and particularly if you're in New York right now, it's not a great place to be in New York right now. Mm -hmm. It's pretty stressful, you know? So I think that we're gonna see some people after this is over, starting to reassess some of their life choices and saying like, do I really wanna be living in a place like this? Do I wanna really expose myself to these really risk, or now gonna become risky areas? You know, you're gonna be moving to a high risk area. And I think there's a lot of people are gonna be making the choice like, no, I don't want to go through this anymore. I want to move to a, to a different location. And I think there's going to be, we may see a movement um, that has to do more with economic resiliency, like what we're talking about, supply chain resiliency, um, the idea of actually having all of our big industries located in you know, Seattle, San Francisco, LA, New York, Boston, five cities is, you know, that's really kind of a, a stupid plan when you think about a, a pandemic, you know, it's, it, it you, you take out one one big link of the economy, you take down the whole thing. So I think we might see people and programs actually looking to get people a little bit more dispersed, um, if for nothing else, than actually to have a recovery, you know, like a recovery plan. You know, we might see incentives for things to move to other cities. Um, that's kind of exciting because that might be what we see. We've already seen this, what we call the second city thing. A lot of people are bailing on New York and San Francisco just because it's really, really costly and it's hard right. to raise a family there. We're already seeing people move to Madison, Charlottesville, Portland, you know, and Eugene to be a beneficiary of an acceleration of this fleeing of the big cities um, that we've been seeing over the past couple of years just, again, might accelerate that change. Yeah, I, uh, I like that notion of that being one of these um, unexpected silver linings of um, national resiliency coming from the, the rise of the rest of us, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. And I think people are gonna be, I think it's gonna be a topic of conversation. It's already starting to be a topic of conversation, but I think it's gonna become a, a much bigger part of the conversation. Because um, people are gonna start, I think people are gonna start thinking less selfishly. We don't yeah. think selfishly, what's in it for me? But part of this is a recognition that we are all in this together. Like if we do this and get through this together, we've all done something together to survive and get through this and grow an economy. So I think that there's going to be people that are making more intentional community-based choices that aren't just solely selfish about them. It's going to be like, well, where do I want to live? What type of community do I want to be in? It's an opportunity for us. Yeah, I've um, just been uh, amazed at um, what I've seen in our community from a community response. Um, you and I were just on a, uh, a call with Justin Freeman um, and his bagel company put out a note that like, hey, if you're stuck in your house and and want bagels, we'll deliver them, you know, at, yeah. and I think he even said it was for free. And I was just like, that is such a um, uh, genuine, positive gesture. Um, and and Justin's not alone in that. I've been seeing that throughout our community. There's a lot of helpers. There's helpers yeah. in the community. And there's a lot of people that just like suddenly they're like, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to work and build something and try and add value um, right now, you know, try and create some positive outcome to this and try and help people and not just sit at home and watch Netflix. And we've been seeing a ton of that. I mean, on a ton of calls, you know, that are just like, you know, people are actively trying to lean in, lean in and find solutions to the problems. And some of them are, you know, micro problems. How do we get people food? Yeah. You know, a lot of discussions are now is like, people are going to need like someone to pick up their medicine from the pharmacist and deliver it. How do we how do we facilitate that? Yeah, how do we meet that need? How do we meet that need? And um, people are like, there's a technology conversations. There's actually you know, like the other call we were on where it's like we had people from four different companies that have different parts of a full on solution working together to create a full end end solution and doing it very very quickly. Isn't that great? That's like, so, it's amazing. It makes me proud of Oregon and to see and, like that. Yeah, and it's just fun because everyone is actually active and working and positive and looking for a solution and not feeling like the world happened to them. And I think we talked about this yesterday. It's like the attitude right now is um, the world is happening to me. I think everyone's feeling it. It's like, oh my God, what is happening to me? The world is crushing me. Mm -hmm. And I think that everyone has to try to flip that, you know, from a resi resiliency standpoint, it's like, well, yeah, but you've got to happen back to the world. If you just let, if you let the world happen to you, it's going to crush you. 
you just have to start happening to the world. And the more people, the more of us that actually start trying to make a positive impact and trying to put in place the things that we have to put in place to make a better future, will it be a better future? You know, so let's not be down on ourselves. Let's just get back to work. It's a Starting choice. Now. You got to make a choice. Yeah. Yeah. So, so did anyone ask any questions yet? I didn't see any. Uh, we had a we had a question about the uh, SBA loans, and I think we clarified that the they're up to two million, and they they do have uh, one for for profit entities. I mean, there are a variety of programs out there. The one in particular, yeah. the, the newest, is three point seven five percent for for profit companies, and for nonprofits, it's two point seven five, which are pretty favorable terms. I would and for anyone who's wondering about the SBA stuff, just reach out to the SBDC. You know, they, they fast-tracked approval in the state of Oregon. So it's, if it gets approved, it's pretty much approved for anyone in the state. And since they're rolling them out, seems like with every stimulus package, new modifications, additional things, just reach out to SBDC and they'll be on top of it. And you can talk to them and say, here's my situation. And they'll be able to tell you what you qualify for and how you have to yeah. set up do that. Yeah, I've seen a, a lot of great websites emerge as just sort of community resources in the area of education, yep. right? Because there's a big... Uh, you know, you talked about the legs of the stool right now. There's a, uh, an effort that's being choreographed around public health, one about education and, and what it looks like for distance learning, another run around the economy. Um, so there, there's a lot of great resources out there. We'll link those in the comments um, uh, for people who watch this uh, after the conclusion of the live webcast. Um, Joe, thanks so yeah. much for making time, man. I'm really thankful that you uh, are, are in our community. Oh, we got one question from Kyle. Um, yeah, how, how do, so in a distributed model, um, thanks for the question, Kyle. Um, how, how, what is best practice in a distributed model that sort of flat? So, so a lot of systems are based on hierarchy, like an ICS, right? In a, in a more flat model, in a distributed model, how how does how does the system itself choreograph in a way that there isn't um, duplicative effort and wasted effort? That's a great question, Kyle. Well, right now there's going to be duplicative duplicative effort, you know, and I, I think that that's one one of the things that man we can get into a whole discussion about sort of network theory. Um, when it comes down to it, if you have a system that's actually more distributed, you will, you will have some duplicative effort, but that's actually end up just being redundancy. You know, that's, that's, you don't have one single point of failure. So you do end up with some duplicative effort, but that is the flip side of actually having a, a robust system is that you have redundancy built into the system. So I think that some people are adopting, you know, adopting this, this method of, method of like, well, how, you, how do you increase uh, decreased duplication of effort and it's like well you can't have perfect efficiency and also have perfect resilience mm -hmm. if you have a perfectly efficient system if a piece in that system falls apart the whole thing falls apart so you build in redundancy into the system where it's a more robust system so if one piece gets taken out then something just pops up to take its place um I, you know so i think there's that question's a very very deep one i think right now we've gone too far on the efficiency side you know and we, we've seen this which is like with the hospital beds you know, we were talking about it. it's like hey the hospitals in the united states are built to function right now at peak capacity now we're seeing over peak capacity and everybody's like oh you mean our whole health system wasn't designed to actually handle a burst right and like no nope, because it's efficient and some of this is like well that's the price we have to pay for having something that's robust is a little bit less efficient but it's a lot more robust. And I think some of those conversations are gonna be going on for the next year or so. Like what are the trade-offs? Because I think there's a balance between the two. You can't have um, absolute redundancy with everything, but more, you, know, you can't just make it so efficient that if one thing gets take, taken out, because right now we're seeing the knock-on effects. One thing gets taken out from the cruise line industry and <laughs> dominoes are falling all the way down. Like mm -hmm. who's affected by it, so. Um, from Facebook, Adam asks, uh, do you think the SBA will be working through local banks for SBA loans related to emergency funding in the same way they do traditional SBA loans? Any, any thoughts on that? I think they're going to be working with everybody and every, anyone and everyone. 
I mean, the, the local banks, the CDFIs, you know, um, CDFIs are the, the certified um, you know, um, community lending works, CDFI, right. what the acronym stands for. I think they're going to be working with everyone and anyone to get capital in the community where it needs to go. You know, so I would, uh, and I think that's going to be an, uh, sort of an emerging trend. I think the volume of demand right now for, for financing is outstripping the supply of people that can actually process it. Mm -hmm. So I think at some point they're just going to have to actually figure out like who, who can get the work done and how can we distribute it? So um, I would say, yeah, it's probably going to happen through whatever means is necessary to demand. Um, and that's going to happen fairly rapidly. I mean, it's going to be kind of clunky for a couple of weeks until they figure it out. But I think eventually it's going to be every single, every single lending institution is going to be somehow involved in helping to figure this out, jumping on board because a slowdown of the economy, it's a knock on effect. You know, if people stop paying their mortgages, that hurts the banks. They can't loan. You know, it's no, it's in no one's interest to not have money flowing through the economy. The right. whole idea is to keep the money flowing through. And even if it ends up being this ridiculous cycle, you know, money comes in for the government, that goes in, that just goes back. You know, as long as there's money going through, the system as it's designed functions. It's when money's not flowing that it falls apart. So I think, and the banks have a vested interest in the money flowing through, because that money flowing through goes to somebody. You know, it goes flew to somebody, an investor that then actually has a mortgage on a building, you know, so that money flowing through getting to them so they can pay the bank back again. So they're going to actually step up to be active facilitators of this, I think. Thanks, Joe. Um, any other questions from our attendees? Uh, or from uh, or from Facebook? If not, uh, thanks again. For your time, Joe. Um, I enjoyed this. It's uh, certainly a little out of the ordinary for both of us. And so uh, it's like the, the tactical information was low because what can you say? I mean, yeah. The takeaway is: is whatever plan you had, make a new one. Um, let go of the old plan that you had because it doesn't exist anymore, and reach out to the resources you know that are there to help you transition to a new plan. But um, you know, resiliency is really. Start leaning into what comes next and start doing it now. Yeah. Start now. Yeah, you know, um, uh, I for me, uh, it's been a period of self-reflection and, um, uh, you know, just like the simple things like uh, in-person meetings. You know, we all took those things for granted, you know, a month ago. And, and now it's, it's like, um, that would be like some sort of Special. rare treat, right? It's wild. It's a, okay. it, yeah. This re readjustment, it's awesome. It's, I mean, what, what's really, really important is becoming really, really clear quickly. All right, Joe, with that, uh, I'll let you get back to your Friday. Uh, stay healthy, my friend, and uh, uh, let, let's keep fighting the good fight. Yep, yep. Have a good one. Take Bye, care, everybody. internets. Cheers. <laughs>